OK, hello. Wow, that's a lot of faces. Um, so as you just said, my name is uh, Matt Timmons-Brown. I'm 16, and I'm here uh, to talk to you today about the Raspberry Pi guy tackling STEM and the next 25 years. But before I get started, I'd just like to say what an honor it is to be here talking to the people of a company uh, that predates me by almost a decade. <laughs> <coughs> So yeah, I'm 16. I'm a student at Hills Road Sixth Form College, where I study double maths, physics, computer science, and electronics. Uh, so none of none of that English stuff. And uh, I've uh, <laughs> well, that was that was harsh. Um, for the last uh, three years, uh, ever since I was 12 years old, I've run a YouTube channel called The Raspberry Pi Guy. Now, The Raspberry Pi Guy has been a little online uh, venture for me to teach people about a topic which I love, and that is computer science, coding, electronics, et cetera, are based around the Raspberry Pi computer. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that in a second. And so to date, I've had 3.1 million views on my YouTube channel and website. So it's just a small side project that I've, that I've been doing over the past couple of years. So this is what I'm going to be talking to you today. I'm going to be talking about the Raspberry Pi guy, tackling STEM, and the next 25 years. But first off, I'd just like you to cast your minds back to 2011. Along with important news, such as the tragic death of Steve Jobs, the launch of Google+, there was also a 12-year-old Matt who's very different to the one standing in front of you on this stage today. This was a Matt who wasn't particularly interested in computer science. Uh, I used to really like sort of consumer technology, learning about tablets and mobile phones, etc. But I never really knew or understood uh, anything to do with the computer science and the actual cool stuff that lay behind those shiny modern technology screens, et cetera. And uh, this all changed, funnily enough, from Stuff Magazine. Now, Stuff Magazine is a sort of gadget and lifestyle magazine. Um, and back then, I, I used to read it occasionally. And one day, on one issue, in one corner of the page, I saw a small article, maybe two sentences long, about this new computer uh, that was going to be credit card sized, and it was going to be 30 pounds, and it was called the Raspberry Pi. And this was the first time I've ever really learned about anything, and it had a small little thumbnail image of a strange looking, uh, strange looking little printed circuit board. And for some reason, it struck a chord with me. So the next day, I googled the Raspberry Pi, and this is in 2011. And whoops, this is what I uh, was greeted with. I was greeted with a very basic <coughs> website and some images of. Uh, the first alpha board. And so the Raspberry Pi was real. And I think the reason why I was so attracted to it was because I was a 12-year-old with not very much money, and uh, I thought I could have my own computer, and that would be pretty cool. And so over the next weeks and months, so this is around mid-2011, and the Raspberry Pi was due to launch in 2012, I set about learning everything I could about computer science, about coding, about electronics, in preparation for this Raspberry Pi. And I eventually did get a Raspberry Pi. This was the uh, 2012 model. They launched in February. A family friend managed to secure me one a couple of months later. And I did get a Raspberry Pi, and I started playing around with it. But how did I actually find this experience? Now, as soon as I started to delve into computer science as a 12-year-old novice, I was immediately hit by a solid block of technical jargon and information which wasn't helpful for a complete beginner, uh, yet alone a 12-year-old one. And anyway, I was very interested in this sort of stuff, and so I powered through it, and I tried my best to learn about Python, robots, electronics, and soon I was flashing LEDs and controlling motors with my Raspberry Pi, which I thought was pretty cool. And now we're in about September 2012. I was looking back on all the stuff that I'd learned, and then I sort of looked at the challenges that I'd had with learning it. You know, trying to decode um, some tutorial which was meant to be easy, but it was in fact rather difficult. And I thought, how could I make this journey easier for the complete novices such as me? How could I make the transition between beginner and geek this a little bit smoother? And so I pondered this for a couple of days, and I set up the answer a couple of days later. And it was, of course, a YouTube channel called The Raspberry Pi Guy. Um, there's a big debate about who came up with that name in my family, but it was me. Um, <laughs> and so I set, up, I set up my YouTube channel, and um, this was the first video that I put on my YouTube channel with sort of that lovely logo, which I made in Microsoft Paint. 
Um, it was about preparing an SD card for your Raspberry Pi. And I thought that my, my YouTube channel could just be a place for me to uh, make tutorials, make reviews, et cetera, of Raspberry Pi stuff. As, it, as they say, the best way to learn about a subject is to teach it yourself. And I thought that it would just be a nice side project. And so this was my first video. It's about, uh, as I said, uh, creating an SD card for your Raspberry Pi. And I uploaded that on the 1st of September 2012. And it got 50 views overnight, which was pretty exciting. Pretty exciting back then to think that 50 people around the world had watched my video and potentially learned something from it. If we fast forward three years to 2015, uh, I have 50,000 subscribers, and that 50 view count um, has gone up by a factor of 62,000 to 3.1 million. And as I said, this is my YouTube channel. And so I've quite literally taught thousands of people about computer science. And when doing that, you learn quite a bit yourself. But not only has my teaching been limited to online, I've also taken the opportunity to uh, give talks such as this, not to as many people, um, and workshops, etc., to children, to adults, and all sorts, and just trying to spread this newfound love of mine about computer science. And yeah, so you remember I told you about Stuff Magazine? And that was in 2011. That's where I learned about Raspberry Pi. Well, in fact, that came full circle, if we're talking about full circles with the BBC micro bit. It came full circle, and I actually was featured in Stuff Magazine uh, about nine months ago on the launch of Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, they asked me to do a little bit of a sort of article interview, um, and that was just a, I thought I'd mention that as a little full circle. Um, so you may be wondering, what's my affiliation with ARM? Why am I standing here on this stage in front of you guys? Well, my affiliation with ARM began sometime earlier this year with a, hello, this is ARM, uh, how may I help you? Uh, so I essentially cold called ARM, um, and then I was put in touch with Simon Humphrey, who organized a collaboration with, between um, ARM and the Raspberry Pi guy. And I was lucky enough to do some work experience with Johnny Austin and his team over the summer holidays. So that's just a little bit of stuff that I've been doing with ARM. Now, going back to what I was saying about learning about computer science and the related subjects, and the difficulty that I had, that brings me on to the second part of my talk, which is STEM. And the chronic problem that we have at the moment, that not enough people are being enthused and, in, and becoming interested in the STEM subjects. STEM, of course, being science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So the general trend at the moment, illustrated by some of these screenshots of news uh, websites that I've found, is that whilst our dependence on technology, as computers get more and more common and integrated into more and more things, whilst that goes up, the amount of people who are studying the STEM fields, which is what that technology is built on, is going down. And this, of course, is going to be a massive problem for the future. And so I was going to take a small case study, which is quite close to home, uh, to do with Cambridge and the Raspberry Pi. So Eben Upton, the CEO of Raspberry Pi Trading, said that the actual reason for making the Raspberry Pi was due to a STEM problem. When he and his colleagues who oversaw admissions to the computer laboratory for the University of Cambridge, they noticed that around 2006, uh, not only were the applicant uh, sort of levels going down, also the skills that the applicants came in with were going down also. So in the 1990s, people applying to Cambridge would have been experienced programmers, whereas in the 2000s, the trend was going more towards people who'd touched HTML maybe once on a Sunday afternoon. And so this was a big problem that actually led to the creation of the Raspberry Pi. And this is visible all over the Western world, from the UK to the US. And as you can see, lots, lots of stuff is being said about it. And so what's actually being done about STEM? So quite a lot is being done about STEM. We have, as I said, things like the Raspberry Pi and the BBC Microbit. These are being envisioned to give children a platform to learn about technology and to get that original experience with tech that people from the 80s had with things like the BBC Micro. And so the actual creation of the Raspberry Pi and the BBC Micro bit and sort of tech which can be given away for just pounds adds a whole new dimension that wasn't present maybe five or 10 years ago, such as the Raspberry Pi Zero costing only four pounds. That, that's a level of interaction which wasn't present before. Also on a more national scale, computer science is now a compulsory part of the curriculum. And so therefore, it's going in the right, the right direction. But as a young person, and as someone who 
Lightwood likes to educate people about computer science and electronics. What have been my observations and, and what do I think people can do to tackle STEM? Well, I think the biggest problem in STEM right now is inspiration. And here we have a picture of, of uh, some children being inspired by one of my favorite thing, uh, things, and that is, of course, a robot. I think that STEM is being taught in schools in a quite dull way. And I think that through the use of, say, financial applications and stuff like that, that isn't the best way to teach people and to, to introduce them to computer science. What we need to be doing is introducing children, and adults for that matter too, to, to the immensely creative subjects that computer science and coding and electronics are. And so I think that the biggest problem that we're having at the moment uh, with STEM is that people aren't being enthused. And as I said, the answer to that is by increasing the amount of interesting things to teach them with, such as robots, Minecraft, etc. And now what can other people do? So I've talked about some things that companies are doing, I've talked about uh, what's happening on a national level, but what can people do and the employees of ARM do? And it was really interesting to hear James say that um, people that ARM are going to be uh, supporting STEM activities from, from schools in the surrounding area, which is one of the things I was going to suggest. Getting uh, involved in your local community is extremely important with volunteering in schools, running code clubs, and giving children that exposure to computer science, which could, which could evolve into something where they, say, pursue a STEM career and then perhaps work for ARM. So the benefits of, of uh, encouraging STEM are, of course, more people in STEM fields, more people for ARM and related companies to hire. And that brings me on to my third small segment, which is the next 25 years, and what do they hold for me and my generation? So it's evident that technology is becoming cheaper and smaller and more efficient, and so we're going to see, I think it's a safe bet to say that we're going to see uh, technology and ARM technology in many more devices, in a huge range of devices, in fact, uh, as, it, as it's integrated more and more into modern day life. And the people creating this technology will, of course, be your generation, but also it's going to be handed over to my generation. And this is why STEM is really important, so that that handover can go smoothly and that we have enough people in future generations to carry on the amazing momentum that the computer science and tech movement has had since the 1980s. And so that's pretty much me done. I've been uh, Matt Timmons-Brown. I'm not going to do any questions now. If you've got questions, please come and find me. Uh, thank you very much.